And in response to the tragedy, Prime Minister Julia Gillard has cut short her leave and will resume her duties later tonight. In the meantime, her deputy, Wayne Swan, remains the acting Prime Minister, and I spoke to him a short time ago. Wayne Swan, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. What's the latest information you can give us on Christmas Island? Well, it's been a tragic event and uh, information is still coming in. It's far from clear, all of the events of today. But what, what we do know uh, is that 41 people have been recovered from the water, uh, but sadly, uh, 27 bodies uh, have been recovered. We don't know if more will be found, so it's been a very tragic incident on the island. The acts of bravery from the locals uh, today, I think, are worth uh, paying tribute to. You can see the treacherous conditions there, the cyclonic conditions. It's obviously been very traumatised, tra traumatising for the local community and, of course, tragic for so many people on the boat. From what you're saying, do you think the toll is going to rise? It's just not possible to say, Heather. We don't know how many people were on the boat. Uh, what I can give you is the figures as we have them at the moment. That's why we shouldn't really speculate about these matters. Uh, we'll have to wait for very clear and accurate information. Uh, the rescue and recovery effort has been and is ongoing. Uh, that will, I guess, cease at, uh, at sunset and we'll have to evaluate the position overnight. We've just spoken to an eyewitness <coughs> who talks of some anger amongst residents that having a detention facility there has exposed them to, the, to this kind of traumatic event. Can you understand that and, and what can you do about it? Well, I can certainly understand that. Uh, watching the pictures uh, was uh, in itself traumatic. I'm sure that uh, many Australians who've seen those pictures today uh, would have uh, uh, feelings about that and certainly I'm sure there is divided opinion on the island. Uh, about uh, a detention centre. It has been there for a long period of time. And, of course, it's been under a lot of stress. We've been very clear and open about that. So I can understand that. Will there be a review of government policy on Christmas Island as a result of this, this tragedy? I don't think it's the time to speculate about the policy implications uh, of this event. The most important thing at the moment uh, is to get an accurate view of what's happened, to be very clear about the facts. Uh, we can have that debate uh, later on uh, when all of these uh, facts and all the implications are clear. Well, moving on to other areas now, in your role as Acting Prime Minister and Treasurer, you announced your banking reforms this week. I note today that the Commonwealth Bank CEO has welcomed the reforms. Does that suggest you haven't gone far enough? I don't think so. He didn't, uh, he didn't volunteer today to get rid of his unfair mortgage exit fees, uh, which are one of those hurdles that lock customers in. And if they're unhappy with the Commonwealth Bank, it makes it pretty hard for them to walk down the street uh, and get a better deal. I mean, at the core uh, of this package of reforms, uh, reforms to empower consumers to get rid of the hurdles that stop people from moving between lenders, to strengthen the smaller lenders, particularly the credit unions, uh, regional banks and building societies. And, of course, there are some measures uh, which I'm sure just about the whole of the banking community should support, although there is still divided opinion. For example, the decision to introduce covered bonds. That will certainly benefit the big banks, but I also believe it will benefit the smaller banks uh, and some of the mutuals. But you'll see divided opinion about that. Well, we have, and, and how are we really going to know in a, year, in a year's time if this has worked or not? Well, this is a very substantial package of reforms, and it will be judged over the long term. It can't be judged in the short term. We've not had this sort of reform in our banking system. Of course, when we came to government, we were immediately confronted with a financial meltdown in the global financial crisis. That put great stresses and strains on our financial system. It's why we move so quickly uh, to put in place our bank guarantees and wholesale funding guarantees. And even before the impact of that crisis, we put in place a financial claim scheme that the previous government couldn't do for 12 years. What we must do now, that there is uh, stability in the system, that we're not as threatened by the financial crisis, is move to put more competition reforms in place because the global financial crisis still lingers. What it's done is impacted on the funding of our smaller lenders and that's why there's so much emphasis here to support funding from the smaller lenders so they can compete vigorously with banks like the Commonwealth Bank. 
You're also copying criticism on another front today from the Minerals Council over the mining tax uh, and acu basically accusing you of backing away from a key promise to refund state mining royalties. Now, is that the case? Well, I, I, I don't know where the Minerals Council is coming from. They weren't a party to the agreement, uh, but the government uh, will implement the agreement we made with the companies in good faith. Uh, we believe uh, that the, uh, the tax that we have put forward uh, is, is, is a tax which will benefit our country in the long run. Uh, we are committed to the progress of the Policy Transition Group, the Argus Committee, which is working its way through all of these issues. Should that process be extended, as the Minerals Council wants? No, I don't believe it needs to be extended. I believe it's working well. Uh, we will receive uh, its final report in the days ahead, but we are absolutely committed uh, to the agreement that we made with the companies because Australians deserve to get fair value for their mineral resources and the business community needs fair taxation and the certainty that comes with this agreement. Are you pleased to see the end of this political year? It's been one of those, those years where there's been an election, uh, there's been a lot of change, uh, a leadership change, but this has been a year of very substantial policy achievement. If you think about the past year, record job creation. 400,000 jobs in the last year, 300,000 full-time. That's a very substantial achievement. Bringing the budget back to surplus in three years, three years early, given all of the Might you try to bring it in even earlier? I'll tell you what, we're absolutely committed to bringing the budget back to surplus as quickly as we can. But as you know, there are lots of headwinds facing uh, our economy, just not the uncertainty in Europe. We also have the higher level of the Australian dollar. That has an impact uh, on, our, on our budget bottom line. But we've got on in this past year putting in place health reform, structural separation of Telstra, the uh, reinforcement of the NBN. All of those things are very important reforms. Plus, but we're coming reforms, back to a carbon price. These reforms all centred on the reality that you are a minority government. On reflection, just how difficult has it been to operate in that situation and trying to balance what the Greens and the independents want? Well, we've uh, secured all of our legislation uh, since the government's uh, re-election. That's a very substantial But achievement. in negotiations, it, it must have been a difficult year for you. Well, we respect the decision of the Australian people and the decision of the Australian people resulted uh, in a hung parliament. But we've got on with the job of working with the minor parties, Bob Catter on the one hand, the Greens on the other. They are a diverse group. I've got to say, I've actually enjoyed uh, working with uh, the minor parties. We always did work with the minor parties in the previous parliament and we treated them with respect in the previous parliament. I find if you treat they people... They may not have always agreed with you on that point. Uh, well, I believe that we did treat them with respect. For example, uh, we had the support from the Greens for our stimulus package when the Liberal Party was trying to wreck it and, keep, and send the country into recession. Uh, we've always worked well with people like, uh, like Mr Catter uh, and Mr Windsor and Mr Oakeshott. So we're very inclusive in the way in which we've operated and I don't think that that has been a, a substantial hurdle for the government. Why then... Uh, for example, has Resources Minister Martin Ferguson come out today basically voicing frustration at the Greens and accusing them of wanting to derail mining approval processes? Well, there are clearly some, some policy differences between the government and the Greens. No one pretends that we are going to agree on every aspect of economic or social policy, nor are we necessarily going to agree with every aspect of economic and social policy of different positions put forward by the independents. Is this possibly going to happen more and more, though, uh, the closer it gets to the Greens holding the balance of power in the Senate? No, I don't, I don't see it that way. I mean, we, we will have a healthy debate and discussion, uh, but we reached an agreement with the Greens in terms of the stability of the government, uh, the passage of the budget. That's a good thing for the country. That's a good thing for certainty. But it doesn't mean to say that we're going to agree on everything. There are divisions in your own party that, that you'd be all too aware of and, and concerns that the Greens are taking away Labor's support. Does the government's recent approach to the WikiLeaks case and the suggestion that it could have been an illegal act simply highlight concerns in the community that the Labor Party is not reflecting traditional values? Well, I don't accept that proposition. Clearly, there has been an illegal act. Somebody has stolen classified documents. But that's entirely 
a separate question uh, from the capacity of the media to publish that information. So we've got to analyse these issues correctly. Uh, the fact is that uh, there are implications when classified documents are stolen. And they have implications for our national security, uh, for our economic security. But that's a different question from the debate about the right to publish and freedom of information. In retrospect, do you think that the government leapt in too quickly on this and alienated key figures in the community? No, I don't believe so. I, I, I believe the Prime Minister has called this accurately. The fact is that when confidential classified information goes into the public domain, it can have very damaging consequences. But it doesn't mean to say that the, the publication of that data and what people wish for in terms of freedom of information is, is subsequently compromised. I think what we do need here is a bit more finesse in the analysis. Wayne Swan, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be with you.